today, ladies and gentlemen. I call you ladies and gentlemen, but you know what you are. Now, if you were the competent studio audience you so presumptuously claim to be, you would have laughed uproariously at my little quip. That is why I'm here, to teach you to be a decent studio audience. You may wander in here, a callow, untried neophytes, but you will leave as fully accredited, highly skilled audience. Remember, you are to laugh and applaud at anything, no matter how puerile or inane or foolish it is. Or you will not leave at all. <laughs> exciting cities in the tri-state area. It's Late Night with David Letterman. Tonight, John Hausman, Raging Bull Jake LaMotta, Pitchman Dave Clark, New Fools That Didn't Catch On, and a special late night report on celebrities and their business machines. And now, a man who owns several cardboard suits, David Letterman. Thank you very much. My name is David Letterman. Good morning. Welcome to our show. And for the first half hour this morning, we're going to have a discussion about people who work for companies that make elevators. And... <laughs> and then a little later, we got a guy from Great Neck who turned in a wonderful sign earlier. And um, we have a fine show for you folks this evening. You, you've come on a, is it still raining outside? Is it raining nasty or just sort of, uh, just... <laughs> you folks would rather not be messed with. That's the deal, isn't it? <laughs> uh, we got a great show for you, and I'll tell you all about it in a second or two here. But first of all, I have to explain something to you. I am steamed. Okay, 60 Minutes, the big time TV show, Sunday night. Everybody watches Mike Wallace, Morley Safer and the Boys push people around. I'm at home Sunday night watching the show, I time it. 57 minutes, 30 seconds. Take away the commercials, 51.30. <laughs> Anybody have any questions before we... Uh... Okay, great, that's just as well. Uh, we got a great show. Y'all already saw one of our guests uh, this morning. John Hausman will be out in a moment or two. And uh, Jake LaMotta, the Raging Bull, is here in person tonight. A gentleman who makes his living uh, selling things that you uh, don't normally buy in stores or uh, wherever else you go to buy things. I don't know. We'll find out from him. He's a pitch man. His name is Dave Clark. He'll be joining us. Oh, now here's something. If you're considering going to sleep, just forget it. <laughs> and that goes for you folks in the audience. <laughs> and you guys in the control room. Uh, tonight, a report on celebrities and their business machines. It's unbelievable, trust me. And... and uh, in addition to all this, as if this were not enough, we have a very special guest coming up in the, what do you say, second half hour of the extravaganza. And by extravaganza, I mean this. <laughs> uh, what are we doing? Is that, have I taken care of the business we need to take care of? Anyway, you folks are here on a terrific night. Thank you very much for coming. And uh...
These, these gentlemen, by the way, are not with the show. You're witnessing a crime. <laughs> My, what a festive array we have here. You know, uh, uh, maybe you're not aware of this, but every year, uh, research departments of major food production companies get together and try to come up with new ideas for foods. And uh, there's a big convention and uh, a show here in town, New York City, and they're uh, uh, showing now products that will be on the market in a couple of weeks, and we have a few of them. Uh, this one's nice. Let me just uh, place this over here. This is uh, from the folks who developed styrofoam. Now comes packing meringue. <laughs> Yes, it's a durable, lightweight packing material and also a tasty, lightweight dessert. So, uh, you can actually eat this stuff. No, it's not too bad. Uh-huh. I'm looking for number two. Has anyone... There's number two right here. <laughs> oh, this is the newest frozen food sensation. Toaster peas. To brighten up those vegetarian breakfasts, these toaster-sized frozen blocks of peas are ready to eat. Just pop them in the toaster, and in just a few minutes, you have peas. Oh, no. Boy, this stuff is tastier than you might think. Number three. There's number three right here. Oh, this is nice. This is a uh, uh, new holiday sensation. Oyster eggs. <laughs> Brightly colored oysters brought to you, of course, by the Oyster Bunny. And here we have them right here. See the oyster eggs, and there they like that. Okay. Maybe a little... <laughs> maybe a little too festive. Now here, for the hungry commuter, wallet-sized cold cuts. Oh, this is nice. See, it comes in a wallet like that. Like to see a picture of the family right here next to the spam, okay? <laughs> that was number four. Now we're looking for, oh, number five. This is great. You all, all of course, know all about the Gouda cheese. This is the Gouda yo-yo. <laughs> this is, there it is. It's work, David. It doesn't work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some of the folks in the audience having a little too much fun. Huh? <laughs> Gouda cheese, there we go. Uh, number six, are we up to number six? Fortune pudding. Oh, this is terrific. It's hoped that this novelty delight will replace the dull old-fashioned fortune cookie as America's new fun dessert. And of course, you just eat down through there and fish out your fortune. There you go. <laughs> well, it's a little blurred, I'm sorry, but uh, you get the idea. Now, uh, uh, number seven. Oh, this is a great combination. It's the newest sensation to hit from uh, Denmark as a result of that country's cycling craze and their recent ham surplus. It's the meat seat. <laughs> Tell the truth, have you ever seen anything more disgusting on American TV? All right, and finally, have we got time for this one? Uh, the miracle of modern science brings you the newest dessert craze of the 20th century, the radio-controlled sweet roll. No need to go out for dessert when dessert can come to you, and we'll put this down here like that, turn it on and, turn it on and, turn it on and, well, I think you can pretty much get the idea. Let's just assume now for a second that the studio was built on about a 30 degree angle. <laughs> oh, unbelievable, isn't it? Teach the kids soccer. Yes, it's a... Uh, worked swell a minute ago. Uh, new products that will be on the market in a couple of days. Coming up next on this program, John Houseman. <laughs> We're talking to Ted Danson. Do you miss doing cheers? You pay twelve fifty-six, please. What about you and Whoopi? You guys still an item? Did you order food?
Is this room 902? <laughs> That's terrific. I call store. Dead dancing, everyone. Oh, God. We'll be right back with more Conrad. It's Conan. Oh, yeah. Late night with Conan O'Brien. He still has a few weeks. <laughs> Good morning and welcome back to the show and uh, what a show it is indeed. Uh, in theater, film and more recently television, John Houseman is a man for all seasons. He's most recognizable for his role as Professor Kingsfield in the movie and the television version of The Paper Chase, as well as some highly visible TV commercials. But his theater and film career as a renowned producer and director is legendary. Would you please welcome Mr. John Houseman. Thank you very much. Nice to see you, and thank you for uh, opening our show. That was uh, very nice. Uh, you uh, played the part of Dr. Kingsfield in the movie The Paper Chase and later the TV show, and you won an Academy Award for that. Uh, now, but the television show was not uh, the runaway hit of the decade, as they say, was it? <laughs> Ran a year. A Ran a year, yeah. Why, why wasn't it more successful? Uh, it was not more successful because it only played to about 18 million people a night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Laverne and Shirley played to about 30 million. Mm -hmm. You don't think it ought to be that way, eh? I don't uh, have any feelings about it. I don't really wish to compete with Laverne and Shirley. I don't think... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, even if you beat them, I mean, that's a... I don't think that's my image here, no. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, now, you weren't the original choice for that part in the film, huh? Well, originally, I think James Mason was intended to play it, and then he got stuck in Spain, and then they thought of a lot of other famous actors, and finally, in sheer disgust and despair, they hired me. Disgust and despair, eh? Um, now, you had a, a, a lengthy career in, in motion pictures, but not as an actor, right? That's right, as a and, producer. Yeah, and what, what kind of projects were you involved that we would be aware of? Well, you were a very small boy, probably, when some of them were done. Uh, the Bad and the Beautiful, Executive Suite, Letter from an Unknown Woman, Lust for Life, Julius Caesar. Lust for Life? Mm -hmm. Who was in Lust for Life? Uh, well... Van Gogh <laughs> and Gauguin and uh, a lot of people. Uh, we have uh, a piece of film, I guess, of you in action as a director. Now, we want to do that now? You want to take a look at that? Okay, let's take a look at that now. Do you know what this is? Yes, it's a, it's a piece of a very, I think, a very interesting film. It was made about two and a half years ago, and it was made during the direction and production of... Uh, King Lear by uh, the acting company of which I'm one of the artistic directors and I, I directed the piece and it's a very interesting documentation of how a uh, classical play gets put on. Okay. To have a thousand with red burning spits come hissing in a pond the foul fiend bites my back. It shall be done. I will arrange them straight. Come, sit thou here, most learned justice, uh, and thou sapient sir, sit here now. You you played it uh, like Humpty Dumpty. Uh, you were you were you were falling over on yourself. You were you were anticipating the mad scene in the third act. He's still the third heat scene. No, all the heat scenes. You were really tumbling around and waving your arms like wind. It was very peculiar goings on. You've never done it before that way. It was all sort of. A, and flapping your, hands like a, like flapping your hands like a seal. Paramount doesn't pay him for nothing. We, uh, we need to interrupt uh, this, but we'll uh, continue talking with John Hausman in a minute or two, so come on back. Thank you. John Houseman is here. We just saw you uh, directing folks in uh, King Lear, and you, for the most of your 
theatrical, uh, theatrical career were a director and a producer. That's and right. the, uh, How did you become an actor? Uh, somebody asked me. Uh huh. <laughs> so that's the way it works. But uh, but after all of those years of instructing people, as we saw, it never occurred to you that maybe you could do it or wanted to do it, or no. were you just thinking to yourself, "I'll wait till someone asks." No, no, never, never occurred. To me. Yeah. Um, in in the book, um, we had. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola on yes, last I night, uh, and he was talking a little bit about Marlon Brando. Mm -hmm. You you uh, have a connection to Marlon Brando also, huh? Yeah, a long time before. Yeah. Because my experience was uh, quite different. I, I gather that uh, uh, in Coppola's picture he was looking around for cue cards and uh, bits of paper on the backs of chairs. Mm -hmm. uh, he played Antony for me in Julius Caesar, and he was not like that. He came letter perfect. He had one of the longest speeches in the... English dramatic repertory, and he knew it word for word before he started, mm -hmm. and he gave us a wonderful performance. Was it a fight for you to uh, get him into the production? Well, they thought I was crazy at first, yes. Uh, Why but, did they think? Well, because they knew him uh, principally because of Streetcar, mm -hmm. and they knew that uh, the way he spoke English he, was when he said, Stoo! Mm -hmm. And they thought, <laughs> they thought he'd play Antony yeah. a little bit the same way. Yeah. Not many Shakespearean characters named Stella, I don't think, it turns out. I'm trying to think, I don't think so. <laughs> Let me ask you a, a, a question or two about Orson Welles, and uh, you had an association with him years and years ago, and... It's a I, long association, about six years. Yeah, and, and, but after that it sort of came apart, right? Well, like all partnerships. Uh, we were very close for six years and then we drifted apart. Let me read a couple of, actually there's three things in your book uh, and you can comment on any of these three things. Wells hurled a dozen cans of sterno at you in a fancy restaurant. Only three. Okay. Three cans of sterno. In Julius Caesar, which you directed, Wells used a real knife and stabbed the actor playing Caesar. He, he was directing it himself mm -hmm. and he did use a real knife and by accident he did spike uh, the man who was playing Julius Caesar, mm -hmm. and it was uh, touch and go there for a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because being a good actor, he lay there in his own blood mm -hmm. uh, until the scene was over. Uh -huh. and, and then it was almost too late. Yeah. That takes the fun out of theater work, doesn't it? Um, no, they enjoyed it. <laughs> the, the final one here is Wells once accused you of trying to poison him with dry ice. That's true. I mean, it's true that he accused me. Oh, you, you did not... And I did feed him dry ice, but I did know that it was harmless. Oh, you thought it just to, something funny to pull on Orson? No, 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 no. It was, he had to hold a tankard full of steaming wine, <clears throat> and the prop man came and asked me, and I said, the only way I know to do it properly is with dry ice. With dry ice. And he did, and Orson was convinced that he was being murdered. <laughs> Uh, John Houseman, thank you very much for being here tonight. Uh, we have to pause. We'll be right back. You know, there are many celebrities living here in New York. You read about where they eat, who they date, but what about their business machine preferences? Come with me now as we take another fascinating look at this topic, celebrities and their business machines. Well, it's no secret that the newest pastime sweeping this country in 1982 is... Uh, Somebody names a celebrity, somebody else tries to guess what kind of business machine or typewriter he or she uses. And that's why we're here at the Circle Business Machines uh, office in Manhattan, and uh, this is Ron Link, the manager. Come on over here, Ron, to the Hall of Fame, and let's get some of this uh, coveted uh, celebrity typewriter information. Neil Sadaka, what kind of machines does he use? He uses a single element variety in his office, and... Uh... He has a variety of various different uh, calculating machines also that we service. Now, a single element, is that a manual or electric? That would be an electric typewriter. Now, what kind of typist is he? Um, I really couldn't tell you. I'm, I, haven't, I haven't seen his typing. Uh, Bill Moyers, and uh, right there he's photographed with his typewriter. That is uh, the, a common uh, selectric type variety machine, single element, correct? Is that a personalizing service that you have where you'll photograph the celebrity with his machine if he comes in? No, we, we just uh, ask for their photographs so that we can put it in our gallery when we do business with these people. Walter Cronkite, I'm, I'm just guessing here, a manual? I would assume so. I'm not really familiar with this particular machine. 
Okay, this is Melba Moore, and uh, I guess from this photograph, it looks like she's just ready to type right there, huh? Yeah, she does. You know what kind of machine she, she uses? She uh, rented um, a single element variety correcting typewriter when she was here last. This would be a tough outfit to change a ribbon in, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, I would say so. And finally, boy, Anthony Quinn. Who guessed that Anthony Quinn did any typing? Well, he does. Uh, he has a, a, a single element correcting typewriter, which goes to his hotel every time he's in town. And uh, we furnish that for him every time uh, we send it up. He uses it for three or four weeks and sends it back. Wow. Thank you very much, Ron. This is uh, more fun than even I hoped it would be. <laughs> uh, we have to pause for station identification. We'll be back in the next half hour. Jake Lamata will be here and Dave Clark. Thank you very much. Paul Schaefer and the world's most dangerous band over there. Welcome back to uh, the show. My name's David Letterman. This half hour, oh, all kinds of stuff. Uh, that, of course, means I've forgotten what we actually have. Uh, no, we have uh, Jake LaMotta and uh, a gentleman who makes his living pitching things, uh, selling things. Uh, uh, and his name is... Dave Clark. That's right, it's Dave Clark. <laughs> I'm new on the job, okay? Uh, we have a, oh, uh, you know, uh, earlier in, uh, in the day we had a great idea. We thought, uh, you know what would be keen? We'll get Elizabeth Taylor on the show. She'd make a great guest. There's this book about her life, and she's uh, always in the news, pretty interesting, uh, talented actress. So uh, we did all of the research and uh, studied up on her and uh, pretty well found out all you needed to know about the woman. And then at the last minute, nobody had the guts to call her. So uh, uh, <laughs> uh, you won't be seeing her tonight, but since we went ahead and did all of that work, we thought, what the heck, uh, let's not waste all of this. So we're going to just pretend she's here. What is your name, ma'am? Charlotte Garrett. Charlotte, do you mind standing? Where are you from, Charlotte? Rego Park. Rego Park, and that would be a local community? That's right. And, and where exactly is Rego Park? In Queens. In Queens. Yeah. Now, do you, do you know anything about Elizabeth Taylor? Of course. What, just what do you know about her? She's been married eight times. Uh-huh, yeah. I guess that's pretty much all you need to know about her. Uh, now, what do you do for a living, Charlotte? I work for an insurance company. Uh-huh, and you're just in town to see the show? No. I'm... <laughs> Some kind of a mix-up, Charlotte, because that's where you are. Um, I was in town to work. You were in town? Oh, I see. You just that's came over from work, and you're pretty much here against your will then, I guess, huh? <laughs> Now, uh, do you know what we need from you? We, we just need somebody to pretend she's Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, that's easy. <laughs> yeah, now we're getting somewhere. All right, Charlotte, come on down here. Watch your step. Now, uh, Charlotte, do you know the gentleman you're seated next to? That's my father. Okay. That's, that's your father? Oh, boy. Well, keep an eye on her purse. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, don't worry, Charlotte. It'll be all right. We, now, here, uh, do, here you go. I'll tell you what, Charlotte, just come on back here, and all you have to do is, is answer the questions like Liz would. You know what I mean? Go on back there, and we'll introduce you. You all right? Can I get you anything? This will be terrific. Don't you worry about a thing, Charlotte. Okay. This will be great. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Paul. Welcome back to the show, and... Uh, we're all very excited here tonight. Uh, a new best-selling bi a new best-selling biography rightly calls Elizabeth Taylor the last star. And what a career she has had. She's made 55 films, won two Oscars, had seven marriages. At 27, she was the world's highest paid actress. And just last year, after a fling in politics, she got great reviews for her theatrical debut in Little Foxes. A legend in her own time. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor for us to welcome now Elizabeth Taylor. It's, uh, care for a sweet roll? Uh, Ms. Ms. Taylor, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, according to the book that's now out, Mike Todd, uh, one of your husbands, once said, any minute this dame spends out of bed is wasted. Totally, totally wasted. True. Why, why did Mike say that about you? Ask Mike. <laughs> Yeah. 
You once dated Merv Griffin. Oh, no. <laughs> That's right. I That's right. Him. You forgot Merv. Well, sure. With a, with a crowd like that, it's... Um, uh, what was Merv like? Well, short. Wait a minute here. Uh, you also went out with Frank Sinatra. Oh, <laughs> we're doing better. This is, <laughs> this is like interviewing an amnesia victim, you know? Uh, when you married Burton, you said this marriage will last forever. What, what happened there? Forever or five years. <laughs> Whichever comes Some kind of a warranty deal there, like tires, huh? <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, oh, no, this is a good one. When you married Senator John Warner, you said... Oh. <laughs> when you married Senator John Warner, you said, we're going to be buried next to each other. I guess that's off now, huh? No. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, um, one final question here for you, Liz. You don't mind me calling you Liz, do you? Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you were referred to as Elizabeth Taylor Hilton Wilding Todd Fisher Burton Burton Warner. Would you do it all again? Oh, yes. Elizabeth Taylor, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Charlotte. I certainly enjoyed talking with you. That was very nice of you. What do you think? You want to see the remote control sweet roll one more time? Yeah! We have every reason to believe the bugs have been taken out of the remote controlled sweet roll. Oh, my. Well, I can't, I can't steer the darn thing. Let me, wait a minute. I'm sorry, here. Oh, it's much easier. I'll move the sweet roll, leave the camera there. There, it won't steer, boys. What's, oh, my goodness. There you go. $600 for the remote-controlled sweet roll and worth every penny, huh? Yeah, bring that on back over here. That's all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wayne. Well, there you go. The remote-controlled sweet roll. <laughs> well, disaster is stricken once again. Uh, my next guest is probably the only person in this room portrayed by Robert De Niro in a feature film. The film... <laughs> Uh, well, I hate to see him die like that. It's an ugly sight, isn't it? <laughs> you don't, don't get the kids up. Um, yes, once again, carnage on our highways, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the film Raging Bull, uh, I'm about to inter introduce uh, the man about, the, about whom the movie was made. Uh, where am I now? Uh, Raging Bull, and the man De Niro played was the former middleweight boxing champion of the world. He is our guest this morning. Please welcome Mr. Jake LaMotta. You know Liz Taylor sitting up there, don't you? Oh, I know. Hi, Liz. <laughs> uh, that guy you had on before, that Shakespearean guy, what's his name? John is? Houseman. He talks kind of funny. Yeah, he does. Yeah. <laughs> he should have had my diction teacher. <laughs> a diction teacher? Yeah, my Rocky Graziano was my diction teacher. Yeah. <laughs> he gave me electrocution lessons. <laughs> I had to get that up. Uh, let me let me talk a minute about the film. I saw the film and I loved it, but yeah. the uh, I wouldn't. I saw it once and I said, "Boy, I'm not going to see it again." It's a it's a wrenching experience, and you don't seem like a really nice guy in the film. Oh, that's true because you have to remember that that picture ended 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and since then I had to change because if I didn't, I would have ended up in a crazy house. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but while making that film, I, it was a wonderful experience because, in my opinion, uh, Robert De Niro, who, uh, I mean, the picture was nominated for eight Academy Awards, and the learned superstar Robert De Niro, a well-deserved Oscar for Best Actor. Excepting for Mr. De Niro. 
I told the producers I like to play myself in the picture. Mm -hmm. But they said to me that, uh, they said, he said to me, Jake, you're not the type. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so they were thinking of using Sammy Davis Jr. instead. But he couldn't do it either because he was too Jewish. Now, <laughs> you don't like that. No, I mean, no that's, like that. that's what we need. That's a, uh, we'll be playing Ramadi Inns all over the country, Jake. Uh, um, I, thought, I thought it was cute. No, it was cute. It was cute. I, the last thing I want to do is get you upset. No, no uh, way. That's, that's the past. Yeah. That's a long time now, ago. Now, let me ask you something. Now, when you wrote the book in 1970 about your life. Correct. Now, what happened, uh, according to the, the uh, film, you got out of prison, you did some time for yeah. whatever, yeah. some kind of... Uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah. that takes too long to A say. nightclub violation, but, right. Uh, but since then, I've been in show business. I've done, cool. I've done legitimate theater. Right. Now, how did you get, how did you get to write a book? Well, that was that. Uh, that took like about ten years, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, at the at the time I thought about writing it, and I spoke to a lot of great writers, and uh, and one way some liked some liked to do it. Uh, they wanted to do it like uh, Bud Schulberg. He wanted to do it, but it took time. So I said to myself, uh, nobody knows this story better than I do. Right. And I had very little education and all that, but I sat down like for four for four days, sat down and I wrote a, a synopsis, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And I finally gave it to my partner, who, by the way, he uh, he, ju he just recently died, right. Peter Savage. He was my partner. Now, how did and, once the book was published, how did it get to De Niro? Because you you maintained that that pretty much saved your life, didn't it? It did. It yeah. really did. I get a call from uh, Bobby. I, his friends call him Bobby, Robert De Niro. Oh, yeah, Bobby. Yeah. And, I, <laughs> and, uh, and he wanted to see me. And he, this is he, just he, out of the blue, you get no, a call? No, he read the, he yeah. read the book. Mm -hmm. He liked it. And from then on, it was easy. Yeah. Then the United Artists took over, and the rest was easy. Yeah. So the thing, you're back on top again. Things are, yes, are pretty good for things you. things are very yeah. good. Well, that's great. I, I, I'm doing uh, college lectures and uh, commercials and things like that. Yeah. And, um, in one point in the uh, the movie, you throw a fight because you have no choice. If you want a shot at the title, but that's you've got to throw a fight. over and over again. You want to hear it again? I just, I just know yeah. what I want to ask you now. Yeah. Days in the world of big league boxing, does that sort of thing still go on? No. Today, if the public sees it on TV, so many millions of people see fighters fighting, and and if they deserve it, the the, the public demands it and they get their chance. But back in my day, uh, I have to remember that I was on Crown Champ for five years. Nobody wanted to fight me. And uh, I managed myself at the time. I, I wasn't involved with the mob. And uh, in, order, in order to get the shot, my time was running out. Mm -hmm. I was getting older. I had everything. I had a beautiful wife. By the way, uh, Vicky was my wife at the time. Right. And she. She's the one that was in Playboy, the oldest girl in Playboy. You remember? <laughs> oldest girl in Playboy, yeah. Oldest girl. And uh, we're still very good friends, and uh, uh, I'm friendly with all my wives. I have five of them. Let me, let me, uh, you brought that up now. She was in Playboy, and the kind of guy you played in the film, or not you, that uh, Bobby played in the film, um, <laughs> not a real tolerant guy, kind of a jealous uh, fellow. How did, yeah. how did you feel about uh, Vicky showing up in Playboy? We've been divorced now. It's about about 25 years, but we've been friends all along. Mm -hmm. she, uh, she's my favorite. We've been very close for, uh, for all these years, and we went to, we went to uh, we went to uh, 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 we went to Hollywood to see uh, for the Academy Awards last year. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, we were together, and, so, and somebody approached me and uh, uh, from Playboy. I introduced him to uh, to Vicky. And uh, she says, what do you think, Jake? I says, why not? Mm -hmm. Why not? What do you got to lose? Yeah. So you, you endorsed the whole thing. I, I, yeah. uh, Terrific. I, I want to thank you for being here, and, and I hope you'll come back and see us again sometime. We're thanks. running out of time. Okay. Jake Lamata, ladies and gentlemen. Dave Clark will be here. Very soon Dave Clark. Dave Clark. Dave Clark. Dave Clark. Dave Clark. Dave Thank you very much. Uh, we're uh, next to finish here. I want to thank the folks in the studio audience. You were wonderful. And of course, our special thanks to Charlotte Garrett. Uh, you met earlier as Elizabeth Taylor, of course. Uh, you saw tonight Mr. Houseman, Jake LaMotta, Dave Clark was here. 
whipping skimmed milk, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks to Paul Schaefer and the orchestra. Tomorrow, star of Shoot the Moon, Albert Finney, from SCTV, Rick Moranis and Dave Thomas. Uh, the world of the future and a report on the world's cheapest movies, plus some small town news. Have a good night.